we can form our community in spite of the restrictions of COVID. And uh, thankfully, we have a special guest speaker here today. Before I introduce Jan Knicker, is that right? Good. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about IE School of Architecture and Design and why it relates to our guest speaker today. Um, what we do at IE is we have, if you think of us as a T, on one hand, we have these deep roots that go into very rigorous disciplinary training in architecture, design, the city. And then we have the part which spreads out, which is the horizontal part, which touches on other disciplines, such as business, sociology, urbanism, real estate, and all aspects of the built, natural, and digital environments. And so bringing together that knowledge gives us a holistic approach. And that's what you'll see in the work and in the, in the lecture today of Jan Knicker. The other thing I want to remind you is that our master in the business of architecture and design is a post-professional master, which will be starting in April this year. It's a blended program, so those of you who are working and want to study at the same time, there's a face-to-face -face period here, a face-to-face -face period in the Netherlands, and then there are classes online. I'd also like to remind you that in the spirit of a holistic approach, we have a post-professional master in, the strateg in strategic interior design and two masters in real estate development and the city. And then, of course, we have our bachelor's programs, and I'm so glad to welcome many of our bachelor and master's students here today. So without further ado, let me tell you just a little bit about Jan Knicker. As you know, he is director of strategy at the Dutch firm MV MVRDV. He's been in that position since 2008, but he's not an architect. He brings together these disciplines He's a journalist by training, but he's also did his, uh, his education in German philosophy, German literature. And I asked him, what did you learn from that? Well, perhaps things such as an approach to the world, a rigorous approach, ethics, and understanding how to connect the dots. How did he ever get into architecture? Well, maybe you didn't know this, but it was uh, thanks to Rem Koolhaas, who also trained as a journalist. And he began working with Rem, became very interested in architecture, worked with him for a number of years, and then went on to MVRDV. Now, what does he do at MVRDV? He leads the strategic vision, but that involves not just thinking and looking into the future in a crystal ball, but things that are very much down to earth, such as contracts, business development and public relations. Now he's going to talk to us about a book that he's written. And this book came out of research of talking to lots and lots of people observing firms throughout Europe. And one thing that I like about it, uh, um, if you're, are some of the questions that are posed. If you're a great designer and no one knows you, what do you do? Let's hope he answers that today. And then the other phrase that I really liked about this book is PR has to be much more than just skin deep. It's a very serious part of the profession of architecture, of building, and it's something that I'm sure he'll tell us a lot about today. Now, Jan, um, he's worked on many publications, many exhibitions. He has great experience. He's lectured internationally. And um, so I'd like to welcome him to the stage. I will tell you that at the end, we'll have time for questions. So those of you online, if you would send your questions, they will be collected and passed to me. And those of you who are in our audience, we will ask you at the end to just go to one of the aisles where the microphone will be held for you. And you can ask your questions. If you would make them brief and succinct, it would help them. We'll have more time to hear from everyone. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming this wonderful professional, Jan Knicker. 
Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's really wonderful to be talking to an audium, uh, auditorium filled with architects about marketing because most architects that I know think that marketing is something really dirty. And uh, I have written this book uh, during COVID and then I gave uh, lots of workshops, mostly for the RABA. And um, I've never seen architects when I talked about this. So this is the first time I actually face anybody while I talk about marketing. So it's a good thing that you have your face mask. So we are kind of halfway through. I don't have to get your full uh, <laughs> reply yet. Let's see. No, that one doesn't want to work. Yes. So the power of branding, of course, you know, all these uh, things, so you have a cheap coffee, you call it Starbucks, and then suddenly you earn a lot more money. How can you do this for, for architects? And uh, first, I need to tell you that uh, whatever I tell you, because PR and, and marketing are not really precise. Uh, uh, it's not a precise science in architecture. Uh, in other things, it, it might be, but here it's not. So whatever I tell you is perhaps a kind of a summary of what many people do, and you can always find uh, your own way. So for example, uh, this image is by uh, friends of mine who don't believe in the architectural render, uh, and they uh, only want to make uh, collages. And I told them that's not a good idea, but they still did it, and they're also very successful with it. So um, if you hear my, uh, my, my story, then maybe you, uh, it will inspire you to find your own way. And I will give you lots of different examples of how others do it. But uh, basically, I'm uh, working in strategy and development uh, for MVIDV, which is a, uh, an office that, uh, or a practice that uh, does all kinds of things from all scales, like this kitchen made out of glass that you have to uh, clean a lot. I cannot recommend it. Um, uh, holiday homes like this one for Alain de Botton in Britain. Uh, the market hall in Rotterdam might be uh, famous. Uh, and this uh, library was just on your introductory film, so uh, you might know it in, in China. And uh, we don't consider ourselves to be uh, star architects because we're kind of middle class and we're also trying sometimes to build really, really economic, like here in the port of Amsterdam, below 1,000 euro per square meter. And that is also something that we consider a great success because the building is still super good. Um, we also engage in uh, bottom-up uh, initiatives. Here you see a former canal, which we are going to hopefully open again together with the people who live there in the neighborhood. So uh, that is a lot. And Martha already told you, I have studied German classic literature and a little bit of uh, advertisement. So I'm not a, an architect, but uh, one day I met Ram Kohas and he said, I used to be a journalist. Why don't you come and join OMA? so that uh, uh, I have a journalist in the firm. And then I started on my first day to work on a book, and I did that for 10 years, uh, working on books, and also start up his uh, PR, uh, which was good fun because I was very young, and he put me on the table with lots of uh, people that were very important, and uh, they were sometimes a bit annoyed that there was this child, uh, but uh, I had, at least I had a really good time. When I left, uh, I mean, when I started, there were 40 people at RMA. When I left, there were 260. So I made all this, uh, I went through all this growth. And with this growth, also my uh, responsibilities became bigger. You can see all these things that I did at RMA. So at a certain moment, you see it becomes bigger and bigger. And also when I started alone, 10 years later, I had 10 people uh, working only on PR, and there was also a business development team. So you see that uh, maybe an architect like Ram, who uh, was a journalist, really had a wonderful understanding how important the press is and communication. Um, I was there when he uh, received the Pritzker Prize, and also that was a bit uh, awkward sometimes because he took me everywhere where I'm not was supposed, where I wasn't supposed to be, and I was. Um, sometimes almost a bit uh, <laughs> insulting to the, the other people, but it was a wonderful experience. I was there when he opened the Se Seattle Public Library, organized a part of that. And here, when uh, Giuliani was still a hero in America and not a sad figure, we opened the Prada stores. Uh, and uh, I also built the first website for OMA, which uh, was all parametric at the time. 
Um, and then uh, came social media and uh, uh, early adapters at OMA started to publish the work that was uh, protected by NDAs. And so I had to basically police, I had to become member of all kinds of social mediums to, uh, to police them. And also to make sure that the right image of REM is, uh, is out there and not the wrong image. But somehow they, they cannot, he was a bit tipsy when this was taken and uh, it's still on Wikipedia, I think. So it's, uh, it didn't really work. Um, then uh, MVDV called whether I wanted to change uh, uh, to this uh, uh, practice and uh, I knew them from these kind of things. Uh, I came there and they said you can do uh, PR and I started to, um, to have, uh, well I had three weeks with uh, uh, getting uh, typos out of texts and then the global financial crisis started and that was a very uh, bad moment of course because uh, uh, I might lose my job. Huh? Architects are always uh, uh, riding the waves of the economy. So uh, together with a colleague, we decided to not lose our jobs and also to not lose the jobs of anybody else. And so we also uh, did, instead of just PR, uh, we also did business development. And that was very nice and new for us. Uh, there were two people that had studied language and suddenly we had to make fee proposals and tenders and all these things. And sometimes if you know, you're faced with a challenge, it works. So throughout the crisis, we did not uh, shrink at MVRDV. So we think that was a very big uh, yeah, success that this didn't happen. Um, MVRDV was quite uh, famous, uh, I believed. Uh, we had this hit list and they were on number 10, uh, 40 people, uh, very well published. But uh, when I went into the archives and I saw the amounts of publications, it wasn't so much actually. So they were famous in a small bubble. And if I then looked at the quality of these or the, the typology, if you want, of these publications, you would see that uh, it was almost only architecture and lifestyle. And any uh, publication where you would find a client or a potential client, they were not published. So that was not good. So I wanted to change this. My other problem was that I didn't have a budget because when I asked, what's your PR budget? They said, you are our PR budget. So everything needed to be done for free, which uh, uh, and an extra problem was that it was global already uh, in, in those days in 2008. So I needed to reach people in America and China, in Japan and so on without any money. Well, thank God for uh, OMA and these, these young people because I was really already um, on all the social media. So that's what I did. I, I went onto social media and told the world about MVRDV. And um, that was a bit, um, uh, almost a bit embarrassing for them because they, they thought that marketing was yeah, a bit embarrassing. They had hoped that I would do things behind the scenes, but instead I went out there and said, look at us, look at our projects, we're really cool. It, a, a little bit like one of these people dressed up in a, um, in a shopping street handing out leaflets. That's, that's how they thought about me. But uh, the nice thing is there was a portfolio so I could become friends with the people that, uh, uh, that had uh, uh, commissioned us, open the doors not only to those uh, uh, buildings like here, for example, a private residence, but also I would open the, the door to anybody who would visit MVRDV. Just opening the door doesn't cost you anything. And so we had uh, tourism in the practice. The other thing I started was a big innovation called the press release. They had heard of it, but never did it. And uh, when they asked me why, uh, so I had to explain to them why we would do this. And I used really bad images to explain what I was planning to do. I was basically bombarding the world with good news about MVRDV and that they understood. So I was allowed to write uh, three press releases and then uh, they all became experts in press releases and told me how a press release was written because you know architects, they are very holistic people and uh, they, they know how to do things. Uh, they also had just uh, built a new website uh, and when I found it, it looked like this. You see a project in Madrid under uh, construction and you see also a lot of white space. So they explained to me the concept and I said, yeah, but why are the images so small? And uh, can we not build a new one? No, 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 we just built this. So I was only allowed to change it a little bit. They, they didn't have a function for text at all, only images, which was very uh, innovative, but uh, still 
we need some text on a website. And so I was able to change it a little bit. And then a few years later, uh, I built a very uh, image-based website. And today we have a website which is going much more into social media. Um, so you could see exactly where I started uh, in 2008. Then the, uh, the amount of publications went up, which is normal if somebody works on it. You have a result. And by 2013, we had uh, a staggering 3 million euro worth of free publicity. I will explain to you later how this is uh, calculated. But then after one year, I made my first evaluation. Is this a success? Well, yes, there were still uh, 45 people working, so that was good. And also the media profile had changed. There was a lot more media, but also the, uh, it changed in nature. So we had only 50% uh, architecture. In fact, it was more, but the percentage went down and I had lot, a lot more, uh, and that was the most important thing. General media was now a third of the, uh, of the media, and that was basically newspapers. So suddenly MVDV was in newspapers, and people that uh, were looking for an architect, they could, have, uh, they could actually get to know us. So that was the really big change. And then we were very lucky because at a certain moment uh, in 2014, this building came and we made a really big press action. 100 people extra in the, in the practice because of, the, uh, of this thing. We also won a marketing award with this. So it was a big success. Then we were again very lucky because in China, this building suddenly uh, went uh, viral on social media. So millions of Chinese people were sending this up and down. And that was another 50 people uh, uh, working in our office. So we could measure the effect of PR instantly, which is uh, uh, really good. And today we have a very sophisticated software. We are now uh, uh, 300 people. So what you see, we suddenly have a bit of budget to actually spend on PR. And uh, in this uh, software, you can then see that one of our buildings was seen uh, potentially 1.5 billion uh, times so that that uh, these are incredible numbers and uh, that also represents a value so the team that works now uh, in total i have a team of 26 people and uh, they also uh, really deliver a lot of uh, value to the practice and then my job is mostly to go and uh, mingle with politicians or do these kind of lectures. Normally I lecture about architecture. I go to these horrible fairs, I hate them, I, but then I can talk about architecture and I love that, that's the nicest part actually. I was a co-editor uh, for Vini with Domus, which was also good fun, and I drink a lot. So uh, I, I have this uh, ability that I don't talk too much crazy things when I drink. So uh, a student, it's, uh, certainly in Asia, they want to test you. Is there a bad person inside of you? Let's drink a lot and then uh, see whether the person is still okay. So that's funnily enough, a part of the, uh, of the deal. And then in the Netherlands, our diplomacy is trade oriented. So I, I'm often in these big groups uh, with ministers and royalty. To, uh, to work around. So that all sounds very, very cushy, but then I also go to these um, events and talk to normal people about architecture because I have now, I'm speaking the slang by now, but we also need to really make sure that people understand the way that we talk. So I'm at these bottom up events and I even had a project myself, uh, which was, uh, which uh, yeah, teaches you again to speak in a different way. And that, uh, that is also very helpful. Here, for example, I have to speak in French to uh, French journalists, which is uh, crazy uh, challenging. But uh, if, you keep, if you keep the language uh, uh, simple, they, uh, even, you know, they also appreciate it and, and understand it. I also write, well, anyway. So how did this book uh, come? It's a bit of an open source story. Uh, Vini Jacob Natalie, uh, when suddenly we appeared in, uh, um, in lots of uh, newspapers, uh, the three founders, they received lots of uh, questions from their friends, also architects, how do you do it? So then they usually would uh, put the phone in my hand and said, can you explain how to do PR? said, okay, uh, I don't really have time. Can we do this differently? So I started to have a, an email, then this turned into a lecture and this turned then into a book by RIBA. Uh, and uh, it's really good uh, to do this because, uh, well, our CEO was reading, so I wouldn't give away too much secrets, but uh, it's good to actually make us better uh, uh, in this discipline. 
because uh, if, if we all ask for better fees, if we're all more successful, I think generally uh, speaking, it's good for the discipline. So that's also a reason to actually share this. And uh, of course, there's this thing, I'm doing strategy and development uh, at Orme, it was called publications. Uh, at Herzog and Moron, they call it the kitchen and others call it communications. But basically, um, if, uh, if I may, it's the sales and marketing department of a, of a practice. And uh, hardly any architect ever uses this. Even the really um, um, commercial practices, they don't like that, uh, that word too much, which is, uh, is funny. But that's OK. I, I like to be called strategist. So um, PR and BD is uh, the way that we have split it up. So public relations is, uh, is making your reputation. And then the BD team comes and uh, gets the contract uh, signed, basically. And so I'm starting with public relations because this is, uh, this is the ideal way to just uh, sit next to the phone, pick it up and get projects. Uh, if you do it right, um, PR people are always very proud that Bill Gates believes that uh, PR is a good thing. So this is a very nice quote, but maybe it's a PR story, who knows? Um, I wanna sh show you uh, what PR can do again. Um, it's a bit like the Starbucks example, but here you have a red car which costs uh, around uh, 20,000 euro in the Netherlands. It's a uh, Hyundai. And uh, here you have a Mini, has uh, two doors less. It costs, uh, no, sorry, the Hyundai is actually 14,000 and the Mini is 20,000. So we have a 6,000 euro uh, discrepancy between these two cars. Uh, and the smaller one is actually more expensive. Now, if you see uh, the, the, the leaflet of the Hyundai, you see uh, the four sides and you see all kinds of practicalities. It has a steering wheel, a USB port, and everything is in gray. So you can understand that this is directed at practical people who maybe want to have a car that is really practical and, and no nonsense. However, Mini is trying to sell you a lifestyle. And uh, in this lifestyle, uh, we need also a nice layout and we need renders. And we need to have the feeling that we buy something which is cool. So here you see a car which is mostly bought in suburban areas but uh, still uh, it has this urban touch. Uh, it's waiting for its owner. The owner is a graffiti artist. So this is the story that Mini is telling you so that you pay 6,000 euro more for a car that you could also get for much less uh, in a better quality because the Hyundai actually has a warranty of seven years and the Mini has a warranty of one year. And uh, so that, that, is, uh, that is basically what you can achieve uh, in my job. And uh, it's also funny how, uh, how uh, I'm working now in, in architecture since 99. So it's not that long, but there is a lot uh, has changed actually. There was a big disruption. When I started working, uh, uh, Rem was always uh, calling uh, Herbert Michon of the New York Times. He could uh, travel first class around the globe. He would fly to this place called Bilbao and then he wrote a 6,000 word uh, story about this architect who then became very famous. And so he was super important uh, uh, writer. Um, and then in those days, you had very serious architecture magazines, uh, not too many people, they were used for the scale, but they would basically infringe on the, the artistic uh, uh, photography, really beautiful um, um, magazines. Also here you see them at the Biennale. So, and then of course this happened, Google came, and they, uh, they basically took in all the advertisement money and the advertisement money left the, uh, the normal press and it uh, uh, actually even made the, the New York Times for a few years was, uh, was not uh, even making any profit. And here you see that they're having less and less advertisement money. So this is, this is actually what happened in the press. And then on top of that, we read less uh, because we're all uh, in front of our phones. What used to be a normal article is now called a long read. So there was also a big change in that. And we have so much more media than we used to have. Uh, here you see just uh, how many more uh, British television channels there are, but also so how much less uh, time we actually spend in front of it. So one of the winners of this is Dizim. They are incredible. In the beginning, they would only uh, ever uh, copy paste press releases today they also write but they are now the most important uh, um, uh, magazine they basically have uh, cannibalized all the others because they run with google and of course you can also buy advertisements which is uh, the, the gray uh, um, blocks here you see number four is, uh, is is a bit hidden because that's an article but is it an article is it a 
is it an advertisement? You don't really know, but they're, they're, they're doing very well. And then uh, we have the new kind of architecture critique. Uh, uh, we have a guy called uh, ZZ saying that this uh, um, work by an architect is a brutalist anvil and it's really quite ugly or Doe says that it looks bad and lazy. So in a, within a few years, we came from Herbert Mouchon and his sophisticated writing to a, a, a guy called, or, or girl called Doe, calling an architecture anonymously super lazy. That's, that's really uh, amazing. And also you see then how, how shallow sometimes the architecture critique uh, can go, get, uh, that things are just, uh, yeah, compared. And then also the idea is suddenly so incredibly important because, of course, we always have to compete against each other in all kinds of competitions. Sometimes they're very well organized, like Strelka would do, for example. But uh, in many, many moments, uh, you know, there is this, this thought uh, that Terence Riley here uh, talks about that the architecture competition is actually bringing out the best and that uh, one architect cannot. Uh, possibly find the best solution. However, uh, as my former boss said, that it also leads to a very difficult situation among architects because we have to com continuously compete. And if you think that somebody had a great solution in this competition and you take it yourself, then there is a lot of gossiping that, uh, that people steal. Um, so that, uh, that yeah, is sometimes quite difficult. But the, the outcome, of course, is, is, is really nice. Uh, maybe here is for the first time somebody who knows this city, but I usually have to ask, do you know this city? Bilbao, yes, of course. We're in Spain, but normally I give this uh, to I ask in Britain and then they're all very surprised. Wow, this is, uh, uh, now I know the city. Yeah? And of course, this building has totally changed it. And of course, there was also a lot of PR. And this city you probably also know and you have a good idea where this is and this very, very clear. Uh, this one, perhaps, uh, here, probably, you might know where this is. And then at a certain moment, uh, again, we're in Spain, so you probably know where this is, but many people don't know this anymore. And uh, also here, so you see there are lots of iconic buildings, and sometimes that's also not good enough anymore, because we, we, might, uh, yeah, we might not be able to even have this Bilbao effect is not, uh, is not automatic. And uh, Rem once made this project saying, okay, maybe we should do something super simple in order to be uh, special again, uh, which he tried here in, in Dubai, that the, the building was actually rotating. So it wasn't built, but uh, it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful idea. So basically we're now competing against each other, so almost like uh, if you, uh, you wanna buy a, a toaster on, on the internet, uh, it's it's all nice buildings, and then suddenly it's uh, yeah. What do you buy? And marketing can perhaps also help you help people decide a little bit about this. And I think that's really amazing how this discipline has changed from being engineering. Then uh, we have these uh, yeah this this Hollywood uh, uh, visionary. We have an evil visionary as well. We have uh, artistic uh, architects. We have glamorous architects. We have uh, super glamorous architects. I mean, you meet her, you never forget her again. Uh, we have, uh, you know, young and wild architects. So they're, they're, they're giving themselves a real um, persona and also some kind of, uh, that's also marketing that you actually design a person for yourself. And here you have three architects for, kind of well-dressed and the Hollywood star who is not so well-dressed. So you see also there is a change in how, how it used to be and how it is now. Architects, they are on the covers of fashion magazines and uh, they design things that are not architectural or perhaps a little bit. So here, all kinds of uh, um, yeah, merchandise uh, almost by, by architects and even uh, Ram Kohas, the intellectual architect is trying to sell a furniture collection. He doesn't look very happy doing this. So maybe somebody <laughs> almost, yeah, you know, <clears throat> forced him to. But generally speaking, it's not a commercial uh, profession for many. Uh, um, uh, most of the architects that I have uh, met, they wanna talk about design, content, art, passion, the future and so on. And uh, but on the on the, in the same uh, time, they also need to be entrepreneurs and it's capitalists and they need to make money. And uh, of course, that's uh, in, in even what is super competitive. 
And that's not new. Uh, I made it sound like this is the, you know, the development. There were a few really PR savvy architects in the past and Beatrice Colomina wrote an excellent piece about it. If you wanna know why we all believe that Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, Marcel Breuer are so good, they're also next to good architects. They also have been uh, geniuses with uh, PR and, and marketing. Uh, nothing about this image is, uh, is coincidence. He absolutely knew what he was doing when he took the image. And Marcel Breuer, you see here with Jackie Kennedy on a construction site. So some architects, they did that already long before all the others did it. And, but today, uh, of course, society also demands that in a way. So I'm talking about branding and how other architects do it. So for my book, I spoke to lots of British firms. Here you see an architecture firm that uh, really likes Corbusier, uh, KM from Liverpool and London. And on their website, you see also this style reflected. It's very clean. The yellow from uh, Le Corbusier, which you would also see back in their office. So there is a real brand uh, and very well thought of. Another architect is Dave Miller, and they are all about technology. They give lots of workshops in technology, and they have uh, uh, yeah, Revit models on their website. And that's how they show every single project. So you see also here, they have both their unique selling points out there. Whereas uh, Carl Turner of Turner Works, he, uh, he was uh, at a certain moment, uh, he became a, even a, a placemaker and then uh, he, he's also running these places that he's making. And so you have more of a festival uh, vibe on his website. And Studio Mutt, I talked to very young uh, Instagram architects in a way, and uh, a bit more artistic perhaps. Uh, and yeah, so the, the unique selling point is something that, uh, uh, that a firm really needs. You need to think about who are you as an architect, as a person, and what do you have to offer the world in your uh, discipline? So um, that's, that's uh, very, uh, uh, perhaps a start of, uh, of architecture. So when MVRDV after a few years decided that we also wanted to have a mission and a vision, uh, we started to write it and, you know, I'm this PR guy, so why, why I, I did why I said, can we say that we are maybe adventurous and professional because we are, were professionalizing and we wanted to be taken seriously. So why not tell the world the word profession, professionalism? So, uh, and then they all, there was a silence and then they said, yeah, but you're forgetting that we're also social. Oh yeah, and all these other things. So we basically now have a, a, a changing uh, a group of adjectives of 25 that are always needed. Whenever I uh, talk about MVRDV, I cannot just come up with one or two words, like for example, big has, uh, uh, I think something with uh, hedonistic sustainability. Uh, that's very smart. Uh, we have this. So uh, um, how to deal with this? So I, I couldn't handle it anymore. So I went to an advertisement firm and they then said, okay, embrace it. Just uh, so we have these business cards and on the backside of the business cards, everybody could uh, write whatever they felt like. I see them all, so it's not like uh, that there is anything vulgar, but uh, we have uh, people that have dance on their, uh, um, on their um, business card. And I think that works also very well and it's funny. So if you uh, do this, uh, you write a mission and vision statement, you would say that the mission is the what and the how of what you want to do. And then the vision is why you are on this planet and what you actually want to change. I show you a few, uh, for example, here you have Tesla. They have, of course, a very nice one because Elon Musk is all about PR and talking. <laughs> so they want to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy, which is a really nice uh, uh, vision statement. Um, Nike is all about uh, branding and marketing, perhaps in a way. Sometimes they're called a branding firm and they have a really awkward one, actually. It's, uh, it's not a very slick uh, thing. And they even have saying that they want to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And because you might not feel like an athlete, they actually explain what they think an athlete is. Basically everybody with the body. So everybody in the world is an athlete, which is uh, also funny. So in that sense, your mission and vision statement can be just honest and you can try to, um, uh, yeah, to make whatever you do. Uh, Ikea is then again very simple uh, with two uh, feet on the ground, perhaps they want to create a bet better everyday life for people. So you can basically be as practical or visionary as you want to be because you're the boss of your own vision and mission, but uh, writing it down is certainly not a bad thing. 
can even sometimes help you in other things uh, if you do that. And then, of course, you need to talk about it. So some practices, they, they basically bluntly put it behind the reception so that everybody who comes in sees what the place is all about. Um, I saw that this university also does this in a way. When you come in, there is, you get kind of an idea of what's happening. Um, but it's also really important. Whenever I visit an architecture office, I try to go to somebody who sits at a desk and works there and ask them, what do you do? And quite often they, are, they, they don't come so far. They just say, oh, uh, of course, there's this guy from MVRDV and the boss is coming along. We do nice things. So it's much better if you would actually talk to, uh, to people and bring, bring them along in your vision and mission and say, this is what we are doing. So that works very well. And uh, my book was written for smaller uh, firms, so, but also for a large firm. We are working with this uh, business model canvas because it's a little bit uh, visual. So uh, it allows architects to, to do something tedious, but still have a bit of a visual uh, idea when making a business plan. And the business plan is, of course, what you need to be having before you do PR and marketing, because you need to know where do you go and what do you want to do? So here um, you can say, for example, you fill this in and you say, I want to build or I am building single family homes. Then uh, you, your unique selling point is perhaps that they're all made out of wood or that they produce energy. You would talk about what you want to accomplish in one year. Maybe you want to just continue with uh, making single family homes. And then in five years, perhaps you want to go into collective housing which uh, is a goal and uh, it's, it's good to state the goal because it will help you to actually get there. Um, you have to say who your clients are and you say who they are now, perhaps they're rich families who can build something green and in the future it might be social housing corporations or something like that. And um, then you need to talk about how you reach these clients and this is then of course the marketing and PR part. Um, and you have to think about what you can do, maybe get some advice in. And then there is an action plan, of course, with the timeline and budget, um, how to meet these uh, clients, how to reach them. And um, uh, also for the, the kind of projects you want to achieve in the longer term, how do I get there to be there in five years? And this is super uh, important. And perhaps, yeah, you, you need to talk to many people to actually make this uh, business plan because it, it helps you uh, um, clear your mind and ideas. And then, of course, you have your cost and profit. So we do that every year uh, at MVRDV per, uh, per studio so that we, we are all on track and we know it. And then we make one for the entire practice. And uh, we then share it with, uh, with every project leader so that they also know where, we, where do we want to go. Um, now that you have this, you can actually start working on your PR. You write an about us for the website. Perhaps you make an elevator pitch. They're also really bad, but it's good to tell people. I found this image on the internet. It's really awful, but you know, an elevator pitch is where you go in an elevator, you meet a potential person, you have 30 seconds. So it needs to be super short and uh, perhaps also not too uh, um, boring because they might they need to remember this later. So you say who you are, what your company does, unique selling point, uh, and you need to somehow grab attention. So um, perhaps uh, as MVRDV does all these different things, uh, so we need more than just one. So we could, for example, we then respond to the client. If it's a conservative person in a suit, maybe you would like to say things like uh, um, that we're 20 years, we're now 30 years old actually, that we make remarkable buildings, urban plans. So what we do, uh, that might, some might call them crazy, they might remember that. Uh, Rotterdam Market Hall is quite famous and that we, but that we actually create uh, great value for our clients and that we have lots of returning clients, uh, which is also might maybe very interesting for, for a developer. And that uh, we actually, yeah, so what are, am I telling? We're established. We're not totally young. Uh, maybe if they know our buildings, they have this experience that, uh, that we are crazy. Uh, but we, I then say, okay, we'll make you rich and uh, we make the process very simple for you. So this is, this is how, you, how you can uh, think about what the client is actually expecting you to say. And of course you shouldn't lie, but you should tell things that you can actually uh, do. Um, so here, uh, then there's the question, the decision makers and how do you talk to them? Um, so we would have these kind of uh, decision makers, 
um, uh, yeah, you see that. And where would we actually meet architects? Not that often, most, most often we would actually meet uh, on a client side in the city or in government uh, uh, architects, but quite often all the others not. For example, public buildings in many countries, you have a client that has never built a building and will never build a building again. So there is a real, um, yeah, how do you talk to these people and how do you convince them that you're the right architect? And so then you cannot perhaps use too much words that, uh, that they don't understand. Uh, uh, architects have their own slang. The word volume already is uh, for many people something totally different than what an architect would, uh, would say. Then uh, there is this dilemma that uh, quite often, in, especially in competitions, you have still architects that can decide about you. So you need to talk also to architects in the architectural way. And then you have to talk to the, uh, the other people who are not architects in an understandable way. So there is always this, this thing, even for commercial practices, um, they might be really good in talking commercial, and, uh, but then they might sometimes lose uh, projects because they cannot uh, reach the architects who are in the jury. So you have continuously this kind of uh, yeah, this, 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 yeah, problem with those two uh, languages. And we are trying to say it's an applied art, so we want to talk about what the buildings do. Uh, here you see one of the, the images that we use a lot. Uh, we talk to the people that live in our uh, buildings and we try to um, kind of have a newspaper style in the, the way that we talk so that there's not too much architectural slang. We want our families to also understand what we do. And uh, so that, that helps a lot also when talking to clients. Also, for example, um, uh, clients have un yeah, difficulties to understand what architects produce. So maybe it's sometimes good, like in one of these old magazines, that you actually put a person in a section or that you put, uh, well, what we also like to do is uh, use, um, uh, use real images so that the, the, the way that the building is actually uh, used and we, we go to, to meet them afterwards. And we, we look uh, at uh, what have people done there, how did they build their lives? And these images, they work very well as well for, for clients because they can then see that hmm, the architecture might be a bit crazy, but uh, the interiors uh, have led to really good uh, uh, yeah, people living there. <clears throat> also here you see the, how the building actually interacts with the city and maybe the building is the backdrop to some much nicer activities in the front. Um, <laughs> this is a guy who is uh, posting on social media because he visits all our buildings. So we also post his build, uh, uh, images then. And then what's, what's happening around the buildings you can show. So these are really nice moments. And then uh, that doesn't always work. For example, this is an image that I would actually send to, uh, to clients. One of our buildings, you see it's well used. It has wonderful light uh, and shadow on the facade. But if, uh, if I would want to explain this to architects, then I would perhaps rather use this image, uh, which shows much more of the, uh, the details and the facade material and so on. So here you see the, um, how, how you can yeah, talk to different groups uh, with the same uh, building. And who is really good? Of course, are big architects. So this is really fun. If you don't know this yet, uh, it's fantastic. It's the pitch for a tower on Fifth Avenue in New York between Hadid, Rogers, Dirk, Harbor, Foster, and Kohas. And the, the videos are all online. They used to be online uh, much longer, but they have been cut a little bit. Uh, to be uh, perhaps less embarrassing, but you can learn a lot here uh, from the, the best. They all have Pritzker prizes. So uh, here you see uh, Rogers uh, actually talking to the screen. This is like I would do this and uh, give a lecture standing like this, uh, and that's not really polite. Uh, and then he also changes in the middle. Uh, he, he actually talks very generally about this, uh, uh, about New York and architecture. And then he hands it over to, uh, to his partner. So uh, the client knows that Rogers don't, doesn't really know this project, where, but they have to pay for him. The same happened to, uh, uh, to Zaha Hadid and uh, Patrick Schumacher, who was very much uh, smitten by, by technology, saying this is all new technology. It couldn't have been done before. But uh, the question is, why would that be interesting for the client? And uh, Kohas was um, giving a very nice presentation uh, 
but his most important point, well, in the um, not censored version, he came in, he made a bit of a nasty joke about New York, which is not good to start with something negative. And then he talked about the sculptural qualities. I love this building, but of course they had a very heavy competitor and that was Foster. And you see the difference, uh, a light uh, environment. He actually undid his uh, a suit. So it's a guy who you can talk to. He knew every little detail and he also talks the language of the developer. He talked about the different ways that you can actually rent the floors where Kohlhaas was talking a lot about sculptural qualities, Foster talked about money. And of course, that's what these people actually wanted. They, uh, they actually um, selected a Mies van der Rohe building as a, as, a, uh, uh, as a reference for this uh, competition. And that is a very commercial uh, building because it has the same floor uh, uh, layout on every uh, level. So when the client asked for this landmark, in reality, they meant profit on, of course, Foster, uh, knew this and understood it and he won the competition and the building is now uh, built. So um, if you know these things, uh, then you have an ad uh, advantage and it's always very good to think about the client, perhaps if you have time to prepare this really well, think about what kind of people do I have on the other side of the, uh, the table, you can use these uh, um, models uh, in Quite a few decisions are taken by the brain uh, uh, in the, in the uh, subconscious part, and then the rest of the brain starts to actually uh, rationalize your decision. Uh, that, that's how it also works with the mini. You buy a stupid car, and then uh, the rest uh, part of your brain actually says, it's a good decision, let's do it. And you have these marketing types. So this is, uh, um, you have people that are more taken uh, or, or yeah, how do you say that, driven by domination. They want the best. You have people that want something new, innovation. You have people that are a lot into sec uh, security. So they're the scared ones. So you can talk to these, uh, for example, a client that is uh, into uh, security, you maybe want to talk more about the uh, building uh, process and how you're going to organize it. Uh, whereas uh, Vinnie Maas, for example, is always talking about innovation. So we need clients at MVRDV that want to look into innovation. But uh, so to a scared client, I usually, because this building by MVRDV is something that developers don't believe uh, can exist. So I always say that we build it for 1,750 euros per square meter, and then you get a very interesting uh, conversation with them. It's actually uh, built and in this exact way. Um, or a dominant client you might impress with having an award, for example, the best building of Germany, uh, that is ours. So um, that might actually relate to these people much more. Yeah, then um, working for free is something that somehow clients always want from us. Uh, that's why I, I devoted a chapter in the book. Of course, architects love to work for free. Do you know this building? It's the winner of the biggest competition ever, the, the Helsinki uh, Guggenheim, uh, which then in the end, uh, you know, 1,715 entries and it wasn't even built and nobody received money. The amount of uh, wisdom that was thrown away is just incredible. So basically what we tell the world as architects is that our ideas are worthless. We just hand them over and that's it. It's a very competitive discipline, but it also says that if the Guggenheim gets it for free, why would uh, you know, a provincial uh, developer not ha have it for free? And in Germany, for example, it's quite normal that they expect us to work for free. Uh, it's uh, Hamburg, uh, the example here, you can read it. It's one of the richest cities in Europe and still they organize uh, uh, you know, competitions which uh, leave you in a, in a tedious state. You can lose a lot of money. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't bet on a roulette table uh, 27 to one, but as architects, we are supposed to do that. And then of course there came this lady and she is incredibly smart. She came from one of the big consultancy firms, joined uh, Bjarke Ingels office and she found that they worked for free and she stopped this all. And there's this wonderful article about her. You can read it online somewhere where she basically said, uh, no more free work. And Ingalls calls it a fuck you pay me attitude. And the result uh, was of course very good. Now, all the small firms that I spoke to, they all said that they wouldn't work for free, but at a certain moment there was a, there was a but, but sometimes it's just something that we cannot uh, not do. 
So in my book, for each chapter, I gave them these uh, simple tips. So if you don't want to read the book, you can just always go to the tip page, makes it easier. And uh, basically, that's a summary of what you what you can do. For example, you can you need to calculate your chances. 27 to 1, not good. 5 to 1, maybe. Request a symbolic fee if you can talk to the client. Even if you are paid only 500 or 1,000 euros, they will look at it differently than if it's just given to them for free. It's psychological, but works. You can try to reduce the scope for unpaired work. Uh, so you know they don't need uh, floor plans and everything to make a decision. Always, uh, perhaps you can negotiate that they will hire you the next time uh, or that you get a bonus if you win. We do that actually a lot that we say, okay, we're gonna work for a very low price, but if we win this together, then you will pay us. And uh, if, you if you work for nothing, then you have to tell your client that you work for nothing. Don't make them forget about that. I'm actually working for free here. Uh, I'm giving you a lot of uh, money. So um, then that can be also quite friendly. But also, uh, instead of going into this free competition, why don't you try to uh, create your own project somewhere? If you see an empty plot, I was today in Madrid, saw an empty plot, thought, who would be nice to actually call the, the owner and see whether we can do something together. So th this, this might also work. Well, what's good in, in free is publicity. Free publicity is actually bringing in money into your uh, practice. I wanna talk only a little bit about this, but uh, I spoke to you before about this dilemma between uh, practicality and the aura. So what do architects like? What do the clients like or the general public? And um, yeah, if you have a Pritzker, then you, you don't need to care anymore. So you can have a highly complicated uh, website where you can actually get lost in lots of windows. The, it's, like the, it's like incredible. It's super nice, but it's also not navigational. What your client wants to know is whether you have built his building before uh, for the same price and so on. So they need to know uh, exactly uh, have you done uh, 50,000 square meters or have you, have, have you done a, a small house uh, with eco uh, uh, features and so on? Well, also, Zahadid, you know, she doesn't have to, you know, she doesn't care about anything those days, sorry, but <laughs> her office, of course, they have a website that is not, um, that is not very practical. So um, then again, uh, lots of people think Google uh, is, is a good website. It has very little, it's very simple. So let's make it super simple, a website, but that's also not necessary because we also can navigate these kind of websites. As long as the website is kind of structured and clear, you can have a lot. Uh, here you see, for example, a very good website. It has 19 buttons and still looks very clean. Uh, they're pretty good and uh, yeah. Our website is different. So we have uh, the, the almost the Google approach. You know, we, have, we have only one button on the website and it just gives the aura away. But we, we also have Google Analytics and Google, Google Analytics basically told us that, our, uh, that the people do not use the front entrance anymore. They always come through the site directly to where they wanna be in our website. So they Google, for example, one of our projects and then they go into the project site directly so the only, uh, we see that they are only on this one page. So we made this page much richer. So you would see much more information on the project page because we know that they don't use the, uh, the home page uh, so much. So we're trying to seduce them to stay a bit longer. We put social media posts in there and so on. So that, uh, that is basically a, a data-driven website in that sense that we're trying to manipulate people who come through the site to stay a bit longer in our world. And then, um, yeah, as I said, clients, they need to be able to search things and find things on your website. And then uh, Google helps again, the image search, uh, many people understand. So if you make your website again, uh, like this is JDS, uh, uh, many architects do this now and this works very well. It's the most simple way of actually navigating through all these projects you need a good filter so that you see the thumbnails then uh, for this. Yes, uh, I'm going to media. Of course, it starts with the press release, um, which I introduced at MVRDV. Um, um, yeah, I, I tell you that you need a sexy headline, but I don't think I succeeded here very much with balancing barn completed. Um, you should mention your name because often the logo disappears in an email. You uh, should make a lead, which is the bold part, uh, which is a summary. 
and this lead you answer all the W questions, uh, what, when, why, who, and so on. And then the rest of the text body usually goes from important to unimportant, and you would write it so that a, uh, a journalist can basically just copy it, and if it's too long, they can cut off the, uh, the lower part, so that uh, whatever they do, they can basically just use your text body as their own article. In times of press uh, and, and low budgets, this is very helpful for journalists and might just get you into this uh, medium when uh, one of your uh, competitors actually sent some uh, novel that, uh, that they, the journalist cannot use. Um, also, the images need to be free because uh, many uh, um, publications they do not have the, the money anymore to pay for photography. Then the copy paste writing. So if you would write something, I have designed a beautiful building with an impressive green facade, the journalist cannot use it. They have to rewrite it. So it's better that you already write in a way that the journalist can easily copy parts of this. So for example, you talk about yourself as the architect Peter Smith has designed a building with a green facade. If you must boast about how great you are and you cannot keep it neutral, then you have to try to find uh, uh, also evidence for, uh, for boasting. For example, the impressive green facade is, is going to be the largest of its kind in England, and then you can say it's indeed impressive, or it's impressive because it's uh, 40 meters tall or something like that. But that you have to explain. You cannot just use adjectives uh, to make yourself uh, better. Um, print media, uh, we, we all want to be in there. It's the best way still, uh, somehow the most prestigious, uh, uh, very exclusive as well. They have very long production times. So sometimes we have to wait uh, six months to actually uh, get in there. Uh, but online media reaches much more people like the zine. If you're in the zine, then many websites actually uh, copy this and take it over. And of course, count to 10 on the reader's comments, uh, best not to look at all. <laughs> and uh, then share the link and show people that others talk about you. Because if you talk about yourself, I'm great, then people might believe it or not. But if somebody else says he's great, then people actually tend to believe it much more. So that also works. Uh, television still has an incredible impact. If one of our uh, partners is on television, you can notice that the phone rings the next day, but the risk is also really big. Uh, uh, Vinny was once in a talk show and was totally uh, um, yeah, humiliated by some uh, nasty person. <laughs> so you need to find out the context, uh, who else is on the table, uh, is the journalist friendly towards the architect, yes or no? All these things you could uh, figure out and then prepare accordingly. And that, uh, it's going to be a walk in the park or it's going to be a very difficult conversation. So that, that might, uh, might work. And being positive also helps on television. And, yeah, and if you hate looking back, that's normal because uh, many of us don't like to look at ourselves on television. So let's uh, ask somebody else whether you did well and not uh, take your own... Uh, <laughs> judgment. Uh, social media is, of course, really cool. It, uh, uh, it made, made our uh, company for a certain uh, part because we were able to directly talk to people when uh, journalists would filter you out sometimes. Uh, you can also experiment very nicely. If a post works, do it again. If a post doesn't work, uh, stop it. Uh, you also can adjust the message to the mediums. So, for example, on LinkedIn, perhaps more professional things. On Facebook, you can be a bit more uh, emotional. Instagram, you need good images and so on. Tagging is super important. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, we, we had these billions of Chinese people texting one of our, uh, uh, of our uh, projects, and that was, uh, yeah, brought us 50 extra people in the practice. So it's really, if it goes viral, uh, it can be super good. Uh, every social medium has also statistics. So you can see whether you do Facebook only for children or for people that are actually in the age of decision-making. Uh, we started Facebook uh, for 20 year old people. And now a few years later, we noticed that we have a group of friends and followers that actually could decide whether or not to uh, uh, commission a building. So that's very valuable information. And yeah, uh, of course, you should never mix social media with alcohol. If you, took a, if, you, if you take a bit of alcohol, just don't do it. Absolutely never. Uh, and then, yeah, nowadays, uh, which is really new, uh, we also invite uh, uh, influencers to our openings. And uh, 
that, that, that is adding a totally new uh, uh, thing. Sometimes we even pay them to fly over the world uh, like we used to pay journalists. And now we, we get these young people uh, and they make wonderful uh, movies. Of course, awards uh, in many, many tenders, they wanna know that you won an award. Uh, there are many awards that you can basically uh, um, buy. It sounds awful, but uh, you pay, pay 200 to 500 euros and they put you into some kind of category and then you get a, an award back. Of course, there are lots of awards that are really prestigious and good and you cannot buy them. But Chinese clients, for example, uh, should you ever work there, they want awards. So frequently we actually do this, even though I hate this uh, industry of awards, it's not honest. Um, crisis communication, yeah, we had a few. I, I usually, I, they always invite me to uh, something called the fuck up night where I can talk about my biggest nightmares. And then I talk about these twin towers, uh, which uh, were designed for Korea and uh, were a big success until New York saw them and believed that they uh, were highly disrespectful. So we had a week of absolute terror uh, with uh, being called by Fox News, the worst person of the day, which then uh, got us lots of friendly uh, <laughs> um, messages from America because if Fox hates you, lots of other people actually like you. And of course, we had a bit of bad luck with a, 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 an installation in Oxford Street uh, also here, the power uh, of the media is incredible, especially the British media also here. 1.2 billion people saw that we uh, basically, yeah, I can't call it differently, uh, fucked it up. Uh, so that, yeah, that, that is something, uh, if you make mistakes, you have to also accept it. Uh, so we then prepare a Q&A to say, what is our uh, view of this uh, uh, catastrophe? We try to talk to our clients and everybody involved. Trying to stay calm is very important, uh, taking it serious and so on, making excuses, super important, but it also usually uh, basically uh, takes only one week and then suddenly pff, there's new, there's other news and it's, it's, it's gone. Yeah, when we had our big um, doo-doo in America, uh, uh, Martha Schwartz called and said, there's no such thing as bad publicity, you will see. And a few weeks later, we indeed had our first project in Manhattan. So um, I, I cannot recommend it as a PR strategy, but uh, it's possible to actually survive these things. Yeah, I wanted to tell you how you evaluate PR. Well, uh, you would go to the advertisement section of the newspaper in which you are and see how much this costs. For example, you have a page in the Guardian, it was 18,000 pounds, and then uh, you would uh, generously add 20% in value. So, uh, because somebody else is talking about you and it's not an advertisement. And now we have the software and the software then actually uh, spits out uh, this, uh, but for a small firm, it actually is good to just go to the advertisement uh, section. Yeah, um, we also believe that uh, yeah, we create all these uh, buildings and there are children and your children you never leave alone. And also for PR and marketing, this makes a lot of sense. We uh, always uh, organize a big party together with the client and it's always a very bad moment because you have a lot of fights in the last stage of a project because the client doesn't like the tiles or you don't, don't like the tiles and so on. But at the same moment, you have to prepare for the party and here, for example, we open a library with a, a Dutch Royal and it took us a year to prepare this, but it also got us a lot of uh, press. So that is a really good moment. Uh, for example, Market Hall, uh, Queen Maxima came and uh, we had 100 journalists and then we had 350 journalists because of her. They also the building in the first weeks, we had 800 articles about this building and it basically uh, yeah, that, that was incredible. And so if you do the opening in a good way and invite good people also afterwards, huh, keep going to the building with, with everybody because this is your best uh, uh, PR. It's not the booklets that you make, the website, the branding, all your storytelling, your buildings. They are actually really good. And if they are in locations where you can actually reach them, it's super good to go there and have people uh, uh, see for themselves. And if you have friendly clients that actually like the buildings, Again, it's much better if the client uh, walks the, uh, your potential client around than if you do it yourself. Also, this is something, uh, yeah, we're in a luxury position, of course, that we have this uh, guided tours. So one day I walked into Market Hall and there was a 
guided uh, tour and the, 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 the student who was having the, the group of 20 tourists said, yeah, this is a typical MVRDV building. They don't know how to detail. <laughs> so I, uh, I went there and said, sorry, <laughs> but there are no details is a good thing actually in our perspective. Oh, oh, oh. Um, so uh, then we, we started to prepare uh, also for the tour guides and also for our clients uh, information that they also know actually how to do this. We also in sometimes educate the staff. Uh, there was a library in Rotterdam and they, the staff hated it. And then we actually explained to them the entire concept and then they loved it. And they uh, ever since, and that's five years ago, they're wearing black because it's part of the concept that only books are supposed to be colorful in this library. So you can, with a little bit of explanation, it, it's uh, going very well. And if you have these clients that actually talk that uh, work with them, then it's really effective. Uh, it's wonderful actually. So yeah. Let's go to the, uh, the business side. <laughs> uh, also here, I wanna start with how others are doing it, uh, British uh, practices. I went to MGMA in Liverpool, very small practice uh, in a wonderful building though, uh, in the former UNESCO area of Liverpool. They had absolutely no talent for social media. They also believed that in Liverpool, you talk to people. So they invented the Prosecco Friday where everybody was welcome. You needed to bring a bottle of Prosecco and usually these uh, evenings, they would last until three o'clock in the morning. And they would also secure them a, a really good portfolio because the engineer or the construction company would come with a potential client because this is a nice place. And by the way, the Oriel Suites, this building is super nice. Um, after a, a while, they, uh, they thought this was uh, getting too heavy in terms of alcohol intake, and they wanted to have much more serious projects. So they became then patrons of the Liverpool Philharmonic because they're very young. They never meet this layer of uh, decision makers, and they felt like if they went there, it actually works. And now they have a really good portfolio of, uh, of very serious uh, projects. So that's a big success story. On the same corridor, I spoke to Studio Mutt, uh, and they only believe in uh, social media. So they uh, invested 12,000 pounds to build this uh, pavilion in a, a national park. They photographed it very nicely, put it out on Instagram. They were contacted by the Zine. They were contacted by the Sons Museum. They were contacted by the VNA, just because they had a really good image out there. And uh, they keep trying to do that. And uh, as a young practice, they're actually working for an enormous amount of very um, uh, prestigious museums, which uh, with European tender regulations is not so easy, I can tell you, because you always, of course, you know, you need to, you need a few before you can make one. And then I, uh, I also met uh, Carl Turner, who I didn't know, but everybody in Britain seems to know him because he's actually on television a lot, uh, first in Grand Designs and then later in something, uh, a show where you yeah, go in, into a family. And he says the nice thing about it is that people, his clients, they believe that they already know him. So there is a lot of trust because he's on television, which is, uh, which is interesting. But they also expect from him only what they see on television, only single family homes. And so he wanted to change that and went into placemaking and, is, um, uh, and has then made uh, something like the, the box park in Brixton, which he also uh, as an entrepreneur actually runs. So he's not only an architect, but also an entrepreneur because uh, he, was, he wanted to get away uh, from these uh, single family homes. And then he also talks a lot for the RIBA so that people still remember that he's an architect and not just an entrepreneur, very smart person. Field and Falls in London, they found an empty spot uh, in uh, near Waterloo station and decided to occupy it with an office. They talked to the owner, they built a, um, um, a temporary structure on it and this is their PR. They invite everybody uh, to go there to explain the, the philosophy of the firm and they have a nice garden and they have lots of uh, barbecues and drinks in this garden. So they actually used, they, they were doing placemaking and the placemaking is for them the entire PR and marketing strategy. And uh, if they run out of, uh, um, uh, work, they do something very old fashioned. They look up uh, who they want to work with and then they call these people on the phone, which is quite refreshing because we are uh, always receiving lots of emails and then suddenly these young architects actually call. So, and they, they're not afraid to do it. Uh, so my, I think my staff would be really, really afraid to just call uh, people out of the blue. 
And then uh, a, a very astonishing uh, um, story is the powerhouse uh, company in Rotterdam. They started uh, uh, with two people uh, making uh, small exhibitions, uh, a, a bit of theory. People thought it would be the next uh, OMA, but then uh, uh, very fast they started to build actually. Uh, they were not 10 years of paper architects, no. They found seduced older architects to work with them. And so they built up a portfolio and uh, today they have, I think, more than 120 people. They did all that within, I think, eight years. And uh, uh, that's not enough for him. He now also wants to build himself. So basically he wants to, you can call him and then uh, he can basically build it for you. He's, he just opened a development company. He's uh, working on a construction company. So he wants to have the entire build process and doesn't want to leave it up to others. That's his thing. He's really fascinated how much architects basically lose uh, terrain to all kinds of other disciplines and he wants to put it all into his uh, 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 office. Super interesting. Yeah, Phil Coffey is also one of these drinkers, so uh, <laughs> he drinks a lot to get projects, but also he invests a lot in uh, professionalism. So uh, on one side, very poetic, he talks about photography and light. On the other hand, he was the only one of these uh, firms below 10 people that actually had a PR professional and somebody who could build in the practice. Also here, even though very small, uh, very professional approach, uh, and uh, a lot of investment into his uh, into his firm. Yeah, this is one of my co-workers uh, uh, meeting British clients. He's the guy in the, in the middle, and I could never do that. Uh, that is not my style. And I guess what I want to say is that you have to find a way to do a, a business development that actually works for you, that is very natural to you, and where you do not feel awkward. Uh, I'm, I'm much happier because I'm a bit introverted if somebody puts a name tag around my neck because then I have a, an excuse. I can say, hi, <laughs> I'm from MVRDG. My name is Jan and I want to sell you architecture. So I go to these places where that's actually uh, expected. Uh, so I'm, I'm very well uh, working in these kind of environments where it's all expected. I also I told you I go to these places and then I also try to walk past everybody I could possibly know and like to hear what's happening in Glasgow. I took a picture because in three consecutive years, uh, there was nobody at the Glasgow stand, which was really funny. So that didn't really work. <laughs> yeah, working internationally, uh, of course, this, this uh, book is also written a lot for British architects and they're a bit scared. And usually they say, why do you, if you ask them, why do you not work internationally? They said, oh, the language. I said, yeah, but we work internationally, we speak English and much worse than you actually, you speak much better. So that was the first thing. Then uh, there are many uh, architects are afraid of cultural differences uh, or the fact that they're not an architect anymore. Huh? In China, we're only a design consultant. So our contracts need to be super sophisticated that we have actually anything to say, uh, but you still have less control about the result. Uh, high dependency on core architects and uh, well, lower fees depending from where you come. But I would also say it's important that Spanish architects go more out there because you have wonderful uh, architects here and the world needs you, I would say. And uh, the nice thing is that uh, in the Netherlands, we have relatively lower uh, fees than in, in many other countries. So we can also compete a little bit on, on pricing actually. And we can also do things that we cannot do in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we are not supposed to build a school because we haven't built five yet. So what we then do, uh, we go to Denmark, we build a school in Denmark, and then we come with this reference back and hopefully soon we'll be grown up enough to, uh, to build a school also in the Netherlands. Um, in 2008, uh, it was very helpful that we were already out there in many countries. So when the economy goes down in certain countries and other countries, it might go up and then you can easily move uh, from one uh, side to the other. It also, also helped us that we didn't have a big drawing studio. We mostly have conceptual designers and uh, the, the drawing is done with co-architects which are more technical. So here, for example, in the Netherlands, in Spain and in Norway, the economy went down, uh, construction stopped in the Netherlands. Within half a year, we lost all of our uh, projects uh, worth 30% uh, of the turnover. So there was a big crisis, uh, a lot of work to actually find new jobs and we found them in France and in Germany. So being international sometimes is very helpful 
uh, because you can you can easily secure the future of your staff. Huh? You have you're responsible for all these people that uh, that have work, and you don't want to send them uh, away. Yes, I'm gonna uh, almost end with images and storytelling. This is what the architects do, and uh, if I then show them this this plan and ask them to explain to me, can you explain this building to me? They they still get a little bit into trouble because they also don't know exactly how this works. So if I only had drawings to go out there, then I couldn't sell architecture that much. And what I actually need to do is convince people that they want this. So what, what architects work with, even now in 3D models, is, is uh, it's getting better, but it's difficult to sell. So. Then therefore we need uh, renders and we, we actually make these renders always in the way that we like them. Uh, the problem was when I took this render to a client, the client said, oh, I hate it. I said, really, why do you hate it? Well, it's so gray, it's sad, it makes me really sad. I'm not sure this is architecture I like. And when I showed him the interior, he also didn't understand it at all. He said, so these people are kind of transparent? <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's like the allegory of the cave. Huh? They're there, they're not there. I said, yeah, it's abstract. Oh, oh, okay, it's abstract. And, uh, and then again, he said, this is awful. It's so dark and yeah, but the space behind it is light. Yeah, but it's, it looks like a clinic. He had a point, it was bad. If you didn't see how the building turned out, the, the renders were actually quite correct. Huh? And it wasn't lying too much. Um, that's one of my colleagues, that's hence the black outfit, but uh, you see that uh, it's, it's a bit darker in the front and a bit lighter in the back, so there is, uh, the, the render actually uh, showed this very much, but it also showed um, that there are different ideas uh, about images, so the architect would like this image, but if we send it to, uh, to, to a, a magazine, uh, like, I don't know, an interior magazine, they don't like it. My mother said that she hates the building. And I said, why? It's so beautiful. It's almost like the Guggenheim in Rotunda. And my mother said, no, I, it, it's so dark. I would, I would be really scared to walk there. I said, oh, OK, that's fair enough. So I need to have to offer something which is not so, uh, so dark. Also, this is so cool, this building, because every architect I meet loves it. And you, I have seen uh, three documentaries on this building. But if you take the tourist uh, boat on the Thames, the captain on the boat will tell you that this is a crime against the city and that it should be bombarded. So here you see, again, uh, that architects uh, are very well educated. I think it's important to tell people why this is a good building. And uh, even though uh, the documentaries tried it, it's not always so easy to do this. So here, another one of our renders from the, I love to tell you about what we do, did wrong. Huh? So this is a, a master plan that we lost. And you see the lady here in the corner, she also hates it. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> she's walking around a bit like my mother in this building thinking this is awful. So if we already tell people it's awful what we design, then uh, it, it's very difficult to uh, convince them. So we had to learn a little bit uh, about cold versus cool. So here again, you see the, uh, this one image uh, where you can see all the details would be really good for El Croquis. But for the client, it's good to have the one that shows the building works. You have lots of people in front. It's well used. Inside, you have warm light. Warm light is super important. And uh, of course, yeah, here you see the details very well. Uh, windows, funnily enough, uh, I, 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 architects always say they're transparent. But to me, quite often, they're black boxes. So uh, also in, in images, uh, that, that can be the case. So therefore, we always like to use for photography and for renders dusk, where you can still see the facade, but you can see also inside the building. So you have the building twice a day, 10 minutes at its best, which you can uh, then use. And uh, that, that works actually very well. Many uh, practices do this because it gives, um, this is not such a nice one, but it gives a little bit of uh, ideas about, uh, about the building so that, um, that can be well used. Then, uh, yeah, my colleagues always say, it's too commercial what you say. And I said, yeah, but you know, we're in, in uh, there's commerce, commerce everywhere. At the moment that I wake up in the morning, I see the Apple logo. And then uh, I think before breakfast, I have seen 300 uh, advertisements. And if you, if you continue that, uh, the average person in the UK sees 3,000 commercial messages a day. Now, I think that architects want to improve the world, roughly, most of them. So I think we can use marketing in the same way that a good course would use marketing and actually use a little bit of this technology to uh, 
uh, to succeed and to actually be able to make the world better. Yeah, here you have this brain again. I'll show you a little bit how that actually works. So here, uh, this is a very clear one, huh? what, uh, what it wants to tell about the car. It's not a, a stupid car, no, it's a sexy car. Uh, this is a sexy trouser and actually in your subconscious, this will actually convince you, uh, strange enough, otherwise they wouldn't do it. With this, they sell. And uh, here, for example, 30% more turnover if, uh, if you have dro drops printed on the can because it raises thirst. And uh, Heineken is a, is, a, is a classic in marketing, maybe you know it already, but it has three E's. And uh, Freddie Heineken, who was a marketing genius, he, he turned them a bit so that they look like laughing faces. So if you see the Heineken logo already, it looks like a party. And that's, of course, what beer wants to do. Um, all this starts with, uh, in a way, it's, it's also um, here you see Goethe, which is from my study. Uh, Goethe started to uh, connect colors and emotions. And uh, this was intuitive how he did it. But today, there is an entire set because um, companies know what you think about orange funnily enough, or what the most people would think about orange. And so, for example, Federal Express tells you with the blue that they're trustworthy and with the orange that they are dynamic. And then they even have also very classic between the E and the X, there is an arrow forward, which you might not see, but your subconscious will notice. And DHL, they don't have the luxury of the arrow, but they also tell you that they're dynamic with the colors. And then they have the italic, they're always on the run for you. So these are very smart logos and uh, designed to actually manipulate you. Now then how does it work with architecture? This is what you do. Uh, your core business, you provide homes. Uh, if you stay outside in this winter night, you will die. If you go inside, it's Christmas. So, uh, so cheesy, you cannot do it, but you see what I mean if I compare it again to our own render, it doesn't give any of this feeling that you have actually to, you, it's not Christmas inside. Uh, it's maybe you will also die there. So uh, basically we need to do this better. And even provincial shopping centers can do this better. You see uh, the, the office workers have cold light, the passageway that might be nasty uh, and might be smelly is actually warm lit so that you don't feel scared. Hadid architects, they also play with the notion of warm and cold light. Huh? So the, the cold light accentuates the shapes where the warm light actually is trying to drag you into the entrances. Very, very smartly done. Here is again one of ours, <laughs> which uh, the, the client asked, why do you not have image, uh, windows in these buildings? So uh, yeah, we do. Uh, okay, but where are they? Well, we didn't put them in. It's abstract. Yeah, but the people aren't abstract. So you get these weird uh, ideas about how, how clients actually think. Uh, also, if you have more money, uh, you can also fail. Huh? Technology is not everything. You really need to think about good images. This is not a good image, uh, even though it's perfect. And we're also very used to not being abstract. My kids, they have all these wonderful uh, computer games and movies where everything looks uh, absolutely great. And, but you don't have to do it. As I said, you can also work with collages. You can perhaps, if you're into nostalgic architecture, even work with watercolors or, um, yeah. But, but for us, the render is really essential. Here, for example, we went into a competition, uh, very artistic in St. Petersburg for uh, Dasha Zukova, and she understood it and she loved it. And we went away and we thought we had won this because it was artistic and we were talking the same language. But then last minute, without telling us, they actually put all the projects in front of a public and the public didn't get this at all. And instead the public went for this. And so the people of St. Petersburg said, okay, we want to have this meadow. We want to have the hot air balloon. And they could identify very heavily with this image and with our image, they could not identify because it was something weird. So uh, in that sense, we lost the competition even though the client really, really liked our work but we weren't able to communicate this very well. So uh, here's another uh, image of a competition that somebody else won, uh, big, uh, Bjarke Ingels won this competition from us. And if you then see how much architecture is actually on this image, it's not so much. You have, uh, you have the people from Mad Men, you have very affluent furniture, big grand piano and so on. But if you then look at the red lines and you uh, undress it, there is not so much left actually. So sometimes it's just a lifestyle, like with the mini commercial, 
that you that you give and uh, apparently juries can be quite convinced about this and it's normal somehow we want to be uh, tricked into things uh, the the photoshop version of her even though she's really beautiful is selling much more magazines than the natural uh, version of her and you can have these different uh, you know I'm, i always have to defend uh, commercial thinking so here i say look this this lady wins the oscar she sells gossip magazines and she can be a goddess with photoshop so we can also be photoshopped sometimes because it helps and people and we are not like this uh, axe that tells teenagers that they're going to have sex when they buy uh, something really crappy or uh, you know this this glow and the uh, glow facial glow stuff that you can buy for a lot of money i think we're much more authentic and we have a real story but we need to also learn to survive in this commercial uh, 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 surrounding that is all around us in a supermarket it's actually worst you're so manipulated and there's a long list of things that they do to you the moment that you walk into a supermarket you're really in the hands of marketing and also marketing architects and these architects know exactly what happens if you walk in that you maybe look first right or left and everything you do in there is already scripted so a little bit of that um, for example in the netherlands if you buy a house you go to this website and there are now firms that try to um, you know uh, instantiate your house so that there will be more people and then uh, a, a little bit of red is good enough to actually get you more views so that's that's quite amazing and then the developer of market hall they knew it so they put lots of red uh, uh, accessories into this uh, home uh, so that uh, that got the apartment sold and then we also try to do this so we have now a visualization studio inside mvrdv and here you see in the least attractive part of this uh, lobby in terms of lighting the dark part we actually have some homely red colors so that uh, that worked very well um, and then of course we have if you don't have a studio yourself uh, inside and you have to work with them from outside, you have to find one that actually does the trick for you. Here we worked with Luxigon on one of our competitions and uh, what they came up with was very uh, dystopian to us. Huh? Part of the building was uh, was actually uh, you couldn't look into, was a bit too honest perhaps, uh, but in, in general the, the entire composition and they're very proud of it they have it on their website but for us uh, talking to our clients it wouldn't work so we massaged them a lot and in the end we came to this image and it's um, it's much more uh, friendly to these people who were not architects and had to decide to build a school um, uh, also here for example you see that uh, render studios they can have an own style they're almost like artists artistic they win their own awards and then they also want to do this so when we ask these people to help us with the project in jakarta they of course came with the northern french uh, weather condition because that's what they do best and we were shocked uh, but it was just before the deadline and we couldn't change it anymore but then our client in jakarta loved it because bad weather for them is good weather so it was a coincidence but it shows that you really have to uh, have to talk to your uh, render studio and simply what you have to do is show your client that your building will work like big does here they actually say there will be concerts it will be a cool place it will work our architecture will work here the, the viewing platform of the same building will also work and it also has uh, access for wheelchairs you have a wheelchair in there so that is enough to actually convince the client you don't even have to write it anymore because it's uh, it's it's there even if you do a drawing here a very bad uh, shopping center concept for a german province town you see lots of people in this and all the people are shopping they're eating and drinking also here the architect tells the client it works my architecture is gonna work so that's very good yeah also ethnic ethnicity can be a, a thing uh, another uh, mistake from us so this the architecture might give it away but the people don't so uh, this is in china uh, but we have these blonde girls so that makes it very difficult to identify with uh, uh, with this image for a chinese person uh, here for example we play with this notion so that was not a mistake we it's a bank in stavanger in uh, in norway where you would probably not have a, a very hip black banker from london we thought but here we put him in to tell the client this building could actually make your bank a bit more cosmopolitan so sometimes uh, you can play with this notion of identification and you see that the big brands they are doing it uh, in india there is a different beautiful lady than in uh, in america 
And uh, this identification is super important. Here you see a Lipton ice, uh, no, a Lipton tea commercial in China. The identification happens through the, uh, the, the actor. The aura comes from Britain and the product is in the center. So that's very important in marketing. Then of course, uh, where do people look is also important. This website totally fails because the girls look the wrong way. They should be looking at the, uh, at the uh, form. And also in, in architecture, huh, this, this famous thing, if somebody looks at the, at the roof, you might also, because there might be danger. So as humans, we are programmed to actually look in the same way. And what you see here is that in our render, everybody is looking towards the, uh, the, the, the small concert. But the question is, is that really the best part of the building to look at? Huh? Because it's, it's perhaps not, I, th I think it's not so attractive actually, because you should be looking at that part. So uh, in the render, actually, we steer the, uh, the view the wrong, into the wrong way. Um, it's also good if people face you, but Apple is very smart. This boy doesn't, is facing you, but not staring at you, which could uh, be seen as aggressive. Here, for example, another image that we did, and uh, it's a bit pointless, actually. Where is the center of this image and what is happening? There, is these, there are these, these flowers in front of me, and the action is happening at the other side. And this is the diagram, so you are kind of uh, separated from the action in the image. So you are a spectator observing it uh, from a distance, whereas um, the, so that, that is the action point. Whereas our competitors, they actually did it much better. They made this one. And you see uh, three people are kind of facing you, one with sunglasses, one is looking down, and only the girl from the side is is, friend, is looking at you very friendly. And that shows you that you're kind of, uh, and there's nothing in between you and, uh, and, and all the action. So here you're actually part of the uh, action, and therefore you have a much higher chance to actually identify with uh, whatever is happening. So this is the, uh, the diagram then. Yeah, um, we go through this, yeah, ethnicity. So I'm talking about a bit too long about this already, but basically you need to be able to recognize yourself uh, or your client needs to be able to recognize uh, themselves. So again, uh, uh, the drawings, very difficult to understand. Sometimes you still have to. So the first project ever, MVDV already put carpets into the drawings so that the clients would be easier uh, able to actually identify and understand where is what. Uh, the red carpet goes here and so on. That worked very well. And ever since we are having these, uh, these colors for different programs, and we also put uh, furniture into the, uh, into the drawings so that the restaurant owner already knows how many tables can there be. So that's a much clearer information for somebody who needs to take a decision but is not an architect. Here in the section I already showed you have also a lot of furniture, but it also makes you understand what, uh, how these apartments are actually used. Um, so we, we do that all the time. And then you have sales uh, drawings. So this is a sales drawing for a person that actually has taken the decision already because all the, the sockets are in and so on. So here you can then uh, negotiate with the builder maybe to move the socket a little bit and so on. But this is quite technical. Many people have uh, trouble to understand it. And so if you really want to sell it, then maybe you also need to put furniture into this. And uh, so when we, are, we were designing Market Hall and they were trying to sell it, we made them these uh, sales drawings and um, uh, that still didn't work, despite the fact that it was very well furnished, actually, in the end, we needed to uh, do it again. You see the red accessories, uh, plants, and to give it a homely feeling, and also an, a feeling that maybe if you buy this, you have a better life than you already have now. So that was very important. Yeah, then uh, uh, another thing, we lost the competition against Sahadid Architects, and I looked at their book, I was super impressed how cool the book is and how great. And uh, it looks very professional. And it also says to the client, actually, we can do this. Whereas ours at the same moment, you can see the difference, didn't look so professional, had a big typo. And we basically uh, yeah, sent in these shapes and the client didn't really know what it was. We are, we're not always that bad. So we also sometimes win, for example, here the uh, comic museum, we won with the comic book. And here again, we thought about what is the client expecting from us and how can we convince them? So storytelling is also really important part of this. So um, for example, when we thought about how do we talk about Markthall, 
uh, do we only talk about the architecture or we actually wanted to talk a bit more about the, the stories there. So we took pictures of everybody who had stole inside. We took pictures of the people that live there. And then we can talk uh, in, a, in a very uh, good way. For example, this is a social housing uh, apartment inside Markthal and it looks wonderful. And so this really uh, speaks to people and uh, you, can, you can use them. And also you become friends with the people when you, when you meet them there. Or for example, uh, the Chanel store, uh, Crystal Houses in Amsterdam. Uh, we talked a lot about how it was made because the process was so craft, crafty. That, uh, and this is dental glue uh, that actually connects the, the stones. And this is also how you can talk about the architecture. Huh? Many architects, they, they go on stage and then they say, and then we did this, and then we did that. And this is the, um, the way that the, uh, the logic works. But it, it, it's nicer if you take people with you in a story about your building. And you, uh, if you visit your building after it was uh, completed, maybe half a year or a year afterwards, you will find so many cool images. Uh, images and cool stories. Here, for example, the depot, we can give long lectures about the architecture of the building, but what really convinces people um, and that it is so new is actually uh, uh, if you talk, why was it done? Huh? Here, the director in a depot underwater, and also um, what is the experience of art that you can do there? So, for example, they can give you a very uh, uh, exclusive tour. Here, for example, they, they pulled a rack out and there was a Monet hanging on it and the Monet was just there in front of you and it was like, a, like finding a treasure. And that these, these stories, if you find them in your buildings, they are absolutely priceless and uh, super important to share with the world. Here, for example, you could see the backside and uh, a very famous Dutch painter actually uh, paints very, very precise, but uh, the writing wasn't. So I thought that was very interesting to see. So um, in our master planning, we show how happy people are. And also the first school in one of our master plans where people do everything themselves is in a Mongolian yurt. And this is the school toilet. So uh, you can, of course, just show the plan that you made and the theory. But if you then show, and this, it, and this freedom leads to a school toilet in in the Netherlands with lots of rules uh, and they just did this. And uh, this is really uh, showing that your concept has, has, yeah, has a certain life. Yeah, I talked a lot about uh, commercial things, of course, uh, which marketing and PR is, but we are also continuously talking about ethics and I'm almost done. Um, uh, at MVRV, we, we, at a certain moment, we felt we become bigger and bigger and at 150 people, you feel like a really big corporation and then you have to take also much more responsibility. So we asked ourselves, can we be 100% sustainable in five years? No, we can't, but we will try. Uh, the same is, uh, this is a bit easier. We want to be the best uh, employer in architecture within five years. And if you now look at our green door uh, or glass door, glass door rating, it's, it's gone, uh, it's, it's getting much, it was much, it's much better than it used to be. So we're really trying to reform uh, uh, the office and we have strangely enough ethical uh, conversations a lot. Uh, they're also going with the, the staff, which is, uh, is young and uh, quite a few of them are also very uh, aware of what is going on in the world. So we have to, we had to take away the, the, the pay gap uh, between the genders. We have uh, gender neutral restrooms, uh, which was very good for a trans uh, employee who felt very welcome because of that such a small thing and such a big effect. And so we continuously have to monitor that. What we also have to do is fly less, which is very difficult for a, for a company that uh, works all over the world. Here you see the flight scheme of Vinnie Mars over a few years. And of course, today we have these kind of schemes. Last year we had uh, 13,000 Zoom meetings and uh, that is an incredible win in term for the planet that we don't fly all the time uh, and everywhere. Also in terms of where do we work? So we have <laughs> almost colonial map of the world where we say uh, which studio is working where, but we also have lots of no-go areas where we just simply believe that we don't want to work because our staff is not gonna be safe. Uh, that, that's the biggest uh, fear. Uh, also in a, uh, in, a, in a country that is not safe, perhaps there are buildings you want to do, like uh, but uh, a museum or whatever, or uh, 
uh, good cause uh, a charity thing, but uh, still the, the safety of the staff uh, is, is super important. And then this was one of the, the biggest uh, dilemmas we had in the last years. Uh, we had many more like this, so this is happening a lot in a global uh, practice. This was uh, the new uh, headquarters for Gazprom, and you know uh, Gazprom is on the EU list and so on. And they invited us to a competition for the new headquarter in St. Petersburg on a site that would be basically demolished because there was an old fortress and they wanted to just get rid of it. And then we said, okay, um, we shouldn't do this. And then we had a very heavy discussion in the office saying this building will come. So why don't we uh, make a design that is absolutely radical in terms of sustainability and in terms of uh, preserving the uh, heritage on the site? So, uh, and then if they um, take it or leave it, we will not compromise this design. So we participated, we made them the biggest uh, timber building in the world. And uh, it was on stilts so that the fortress didn't have to be demolished with a park underneath. And uh, of course we didn't win it but I think we, um, we, we can still uh, look at ourselves in the mirror for trying this. And uh, the, the architects who won um, actually also don't build this now because the fortress they understood now is still something important and uh, important to preserve. Right, that was my uh, roller coaster ride through PR and marketing for architects. Um, very long, the book is even longer. So this was a summary and uh, I hope you enjoyed this. <laughs> Yeah, and thank you so much. If you will um, bear with us about 15, 20 minutes, we have a lot of questions that came in and I'm sure there are some here. So let's have a seat, Jan, and- um, Let me sit here. Yeah, sit here and then you can Good. see them. Um, I, to start off, one question. You spoke a lot about what architects can learn from marketing, um, from commercial activities. What can marketing people and commercial people learn from architecture? <laughs> well, of course, a lot. <laughs> I think architecture is so essential uh, for the way we, um, we live. Um, and that's, of course, also I make jokes about architects uh, being the best graphic designers and, and, and. But architects have such an incredible um, um, yeah, influence on the way we live. And everything is, the, is, is kind of the, the, your lifestyle is defined by, by the spaces that you walk through. So, yeah. And also, um, there are a few commercial offices that actually offer architecture to, uh, to firms in a way of creative thinking and uh, problem solving and so on. So, there, there's a lot also the other way, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have people from all over the world who've um, sent in questions. Um, there's someone um, as asking when they have a small firm with few projects, few realized projects, how can they market themselves or what would you suggest to them? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that is what these small British firms did. You have to find for yourself a way that actually works because you have so many uh, uh, things to do. Uh, you, you're an architect, an entrepreneur, you have to go to the site. Uh, you don't have time for PR and marketing. So what you should try to do is find one thing that really works for you, be it social media, be it uh, talking to press or going networking and actually uh, perhaps focus most on that one. Right. Here's a question. If I had it from a student in one of my classes, I would probably tell them to read your book or go to the website, but I'll give it to you and you can decide. Um, this is someone from Basel and said that um, they have a question about the MVRDB business model. What is the value proposition of MVRDB? <laughs> yeah, this is super difficult. <laughs> we, we don't really have a specialty because we don't want, uh, I think that that's the, the thing that deep down inside, we are, we are not a commercial firm. We have people that want to experiment and love architecture. And so um, whenever I would say, let's go the Andy Warhol way and make things that are recognizable, you know, uh, you get a, a morph from Zaha Hadid, you get a white building from Richard Meyer. What do you get from MVRDV? It's a bit unclear. But uh, that, that also keeps my, my job super interesting because I have continuously, I have different product, products that uh, 
sorry for the word, <laughs> I have continuously different things that, that, that I need to uh, talk about and that makes it super nice, but in commercial, um, um, yeah, in a, in a commercial way, it's stupid because you would perhaps do something that is more recognizable uh, if you want to make more money. But the thing is, uh, then you need to be more money focused and we're not. M making money is not our, um, our first priority. We also need to make money to survive but, uh, and to pay people, but we want to make good buildings. So that's a, a mission and vision. We, it's, our mission and vision sounds a bit like Miss America uh, patient. <laughs> <laughs> it could be related to another question about clients, mm -hmm. because of course it's important to make money to have a viable firm, but doing it with the type of architecture, the type of projects you want, um, could you talk a little bit about difficult clients or clients you've rejected? <laughs> yeah, um, I think one in 10 of our designs is being built. So uh, that's also because we're a bit like Don, Qu Don Quixote. So we continuously run again uh, into the windmill. Um, it's, yeah, we don't compromise too much because we quite often believe that we are right. Uh, and um, I think we have to learn to explain ourselves even better so that the clients understand where we come from. So in that sense, the communication is super important. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. One more about uh, clients. How aggressive do you recommend being in going after a project without ever having spoken to the client? It's awful, and that's of course what competitions do. So uh, I would always uh, uh, prefer a competition where you have a midterm presentation and where you get actually a response from the client, because without noticing, you could be actually in their uh, in their tolerance outback. But quite often, you don't have the the luxury, so you just have to uh, do a lot of research into um, what they actually write, and perhaps also. This is very smart. We have this lady who is also a journalist in our office. She, she reads the brief and she adapts all the texts so that the client is recognizing his, his or her own words and sees that we actually uh, try to understand their problems. And that is maybe not the last uh, solution then, but at least they feel that we, that we have actually listened to them. Fantastic. If people from the audience have questions, I just wanted to tell you one thing, maybe you don't know, when you were talking about competitions, um, our director of Bachelor in Design, Edgar Gonzalez, and I ran a competition here in Madrid, MVRDV uh, did not win. <laughs> However, uh, we did have the midterm discussion with the client. Um, all firms that were finalists um, uh, were paid and paid a handsome sum because they were not required to hand in anything except 20 images and do a presentation. Mm. They could do anything they want. The first phase was a request for qualifications that was limited to um, three pages of text in mm. um, about 300 words for three questions. So some of us, I think, have listened to your, your good advice. Um, question, I think, on the, on the right-hand side. Yes. Uh, thanks for the amazing presentation. Uh, that was a really valuable information for the presentation of our design and for the company. What would be your advice for marketing ourselves for uh, finding a job in a really, really good company or like, to put in our CV and portfolio? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I get that actually a lot. Uh, that, that is a little bit how, uh, how are people at MVRDV or other firms looking at portfolios of, uh, of people to hire. And of course, they also have a certain expectation what uh, um, they will see whether your ideas and whether you will fit into, uh, into the company. And if you come with a portfolio, which is totally uh, nostalgic, uh, and you want to uh, work at RMA, then you need to think about a way that the uh, recruiter at RMA would think um, that is still really good. So maybe go into technical details, uh, maybe um, select a layout that is very much in the line with what the firm does. 
Um, if you make a portfolio for yourself and then uh, you think you can send it to anyone, um, that is mass mailing a bit. Huh? So you have to adapt it to, to every firm, do a little bit of research. How do they look? What do they expect? What do they think is important? Uh, and then talk to them in a way that they would expect it. Know your client. <laughs> Great, thank you. Any other questions from the physical audience? Then how about one final question from online? Um, um, and this is kind of a philosophical question. It's what kind, what kind of questions can we begin to ask ourselves to orient in a more concrete direction our brand? So how would somebody start by understanding what their brand is? What questions should they ask themselves? Who am I is a good one. It's very philosophical. Who am I? Who am I? <laughs> <laughs> and also, I think um, marketing just follows your passions. You should never try to, um, I'm, I, I believe that I, I can only do this job because it's authentic and because I absolutely love what we do. If, um, if this wouldn't be the case, then I, I would lie. And, uh, and then you, you turn into a liar as a profession. So I think it's whatever you do and whatever you want to offer the world needs to be based on your interest and your passion and what you want to do. And PR and marketing are only a tool to help you. Uh, um, uh, I also will stop talking about PR and marketing uh, quite soon after this because I want to return to talk about architecture because it's much more um, uh, essential and important. But uh, I also believe that, that, uh, that as a tool, it will really help architects to, uh, to um, achieve their goals much better. But the goals, that's what it's all about. And of course, good architecture, yeah, that's what we are all, that was what, what's driving us. That's why I work at an architecture firm. Uh, I'm not selling soap. I think with that, I, I think the passion that you feel for architecture, certainly what we feel here at IE School of Architecture and Design, education of architects, designers, and that ecosystem that goes beyond just the classical disciplines. Um, I'm sorry, we really don't have more time for questions. It's very, very late. And I know that Jan has had a, a full day. Um, so would you please join me in thanking him warmly once again for this wonderful presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>